Well, good afternoon um, and welcome to the latest in Follow the Entrepreneur's briefing series of the future of 5G. Now, this series is designed to lead to our annual Follow the Entrepreneur Investor Summit, which this year will be in Mykonos in October. Now, the purpose of these briefings is to highlight ecosystems which contain the disruptors of tomorrow. We're going to develop our understanding by connecting with these entrepreneurs and their businesses, and therefore sharing this understanding through the briefings, culminating in our summit later this year. Now, today, we're discussing the future of 5G, as I said, with a panel of guests whose very businesses highlight the breadth of 5G's future scope. And I hope that all of you out there have seen and listened to the interviews that we've conducted with this panel. They're all available on our YouTube and LinkedIn pages, and I'd encourage you to have a look at them if you've not done so already. Now, today's session will be driven by our audience's questions. I'd ask that you pose any questions you have as we go through, and we'll pick them up as we open the floor up to the panel. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce them. <clears throat> we are very pleased to welcome business leaders from across the economy. All of them are focused on the next generation in their particular area. Anthony Codling is the CEO and founder of Twindig, one of the UK's leading property portals. Now, while I'm not gonna show any favor in our discussion today, I have to confess that Anthony is also a friend and someone with whom I've competed and worked in the past. He was and is one of the UK's leading commentators on the residential market in the UK, a fact borne out by his regular appearances in the media. Jonathan Evans is the CEO and co-founder of Connect Air, a company that believes that the future of flight is direct and on demand. And Jonathan started his career in the US Army before his professional path led him to become one of the leading software entrepreneurs in drone technology, establishing the first skyways for drones to operate as intelligent IoT in manned airspace using 5G. Rob Gorby is the Chief Commercial Officer of Drive Software Services Limited, a company which is pioneering the management of fleet vehicles. And by background, Rob is a marketeer and he's deploying that skill set to a market which remains dominated, if I may, Rob, by Excel spreadsheets. Alina Rissum is the 5G Accelerator Manager for Weira UK, the UK's first 5G application accelerator dedicated to scaling startups. Weira connects Telefonica with disruptors, helping startups to find innovative solutions for Telefonica with a current client base of over 350 million customers globally. Helena herself is a specialist in tech and investment, and she helps businesses grow and deliver to the highest scale of efficiency. Roberto Mugolesi Dole, Dow, forgive me, is a mathematician by profession. And she's the integrated applications manager at the European Space Agency. Her extensive experience with the ESA makes her uniquely positioned to share the peaceful purposes and means that the agency creates for the future of communication systems, the next generation of terrestrial mobile systems. Now, before um, we go into a lot more detail in terms of uh, what the panel is, is, is hoping to say about their own businesses and their own views of the world, 5G promises a lot. And I wonder if, do we need all this bandwidth? So, Rob, could I start with you? Yeah, I think in terms of, for me, more connectivity is definitely better. It, it, it eases every kind of, I guess, day-to-day -day activity that we do. Um, if you imagine the sort of strides we've made in technology over the years, you know, going from the old dial-up, waiting for things to happen to where we are today, we're just going to get to the next level. From us, specifically within drive and within mobility, 5G is just going to open up so many more opportunities to actually implement the things that we've been talking about and imagining for years but which were always just a pipe dream because you never had that connectivity to enable driverless cars to enable the, the drones uh, drone deliveries etc we're now getting to a point where we we'll actually will have that technology to enable those pipe dreams to become a reality so in my from my perspective absolutely we definitely do need it and jonathan obviously rob alluded to driverless cars but i mean obviously it's more than that isn't it we get into the air here yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the real advantages of 5G is that it actually has um, network slicing, so you can actually use different channels. The, the, the uh, metaphor that I, I use is that if you think of, of the LTE system, the long-term evolution of the telco networks, that's what LTE stands for, in the fourth generation, 
uh, 4G that we live and, and love and, and uh, work with today. Um, that's sort of like the brightest incandescent bulb of data that we can put on top of these telco towers, right? And that that's a lot of bright data, if you will, you know, blanketing our cities these days, but it's still just this big one channel of light, if you will, of data, right? 5G lets us basically turn the system into a bunch of laser beams that can direct enormous amounts of data in very specific areas that, um, with enormous amounts of trust, if you will, and robustness in, in the infrastructure. And being able to switch between those channels allows you to uh, provide it as a, a new kind of infrastructure. So in aviation, for example, we need to trust that signal. In autonomous cars, we need to trust that signal. It can't just, you can't drop a call in the air when you have a drone on a, on a path with a helicopter, right? And, and so uh, 5G has the promise to give us, especially that feature, um, the, the channel slicing and, and being able to give a dedicated line to say an aviation channel that is certified and regulated by uh, the FAA or the CAAs of the world. Okay. Roberta, uh, space is obviously part of this concept. How does that integrate with the terrestrial side of things what, what, what from the ESA's point of view is 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 the 5G opportunity so <clears throat> we have already heard uh, about uh, let's say the the a lot of opportunity which uh, uh, 5G is bringing to the business to the corporation because of uh, the characteristics uh, of uh, let's say uh, high traffic uh, low latency and so on but you have to imagine that uh, <clears throat> In order to answer this, uh, we need to think uh, also how the, let's say the 5G uh, was initially thought in the sense that what was done for the first time is not to try to plan a network and then to see which services can, can, can become on top of it. But basically they have approach vertically as we know now. So basically, means identify area, which are basically the, the vertical sector, and then try to see what would be the needs of the sector, okay? And let's say this indeed has something to do with us because this area are actually the vertical sector in which we are, let's say, deploying application, okay? Now, <clears throat> If you can imagine in our application, of course, uh, urban area, rural area, and so on, but uh, there are still, although let's say it's clear that uh, there will be a lot of the area already covered by uh, 5G. Indeed, there are some areas that they are not covered. So there you need the satellite communication. So you need uh, satellite and you need to, to have the capability to switch between, uh, let's say, SATCOM with, uh, with the 5G in order to provide the data to them. So indeed, we are, let's say, very much uh, interested. And the, indeed, we are very much interested also in the product, in the technology, and the, the agency, uh, so the European Space Agency, has uh, tried to, since the beginning, to be involved in the 5G. So uh, uh, communicating with the telco. And uh, indeed, um, I can also say that uh, here in uh, Arwell, uh, in, the, in the campus where we have, uh, let's say, our um, European Space Agency site, we have set up a 5G hub uh, that will be well made available to industry and uh, to company to try out also 5G product and let's say switching between SATCOM and 5G because we have an antenna to for the communication. Understood, thank you. Anthony, <clears throat> housing, an area in which you work, we all have a lot of bandwidth, we're all connected sometimes more than others, but I mean, is 5G going to, going to pose the same challenges but the same opportunities for housing as it could for mobility? I, uh absolutely and uh, you know i feel a bit low tech compared to you know cars planes and satellites talking about housing um here but you know we may not live in caves anymore but the housing market currently operates on no g rather than 5g um and the best example i can give of that is that currently in the uk one in three housing transactions fails 
because of the inefficiency of a paper-based system. And 5G creates a huge opportunity, right? It allows anyone anywhere to be online. Um, and the speed, security, and trust of 5G services allows us for the first time to contemplate digital housing transactions. And combine that with the pandemic, which has kind of accelerated the adoption of the digital reality. So we're like today, we're happy to have meetings online, we order our food online, you know, we stream our, we stream our TV. So it's no longer, we just feel safe buying books online. Um, and that opportunity combining 5G and the acceptance of the digital reality. Um, you know, if we cut down that fall through rate from one in three, 5G could enable us to increase the number of housing transactions by 50%, right? That, that's a huge increase in the liquidity of what in the UK is a really inefficient housing market. So it's not as high tech as the other speakers, but the, the opportunity that, that 5G affords us is, is just incredible. And to that opportunity, and I think you, you all have sort of highlighted that it's it's something which we should we should not only take seriously, but actually perceive as an opportunity. Helena, when as the investor on this panel, if I may, how how does five G work in your space, and, and and what are the opportunities that you see from from that perspective? Um, so from the space that I'm working on, which is accelerating startups, um, we're looking at um, accelerating startups uh, that would be commercial applications of 5G. Um, and that really means for us in particular, um, the corporate partners that we onboard as challenge owners um, and the, the interests that they have in particular solutions within certain verticals. Um, and so an interesting thing that we found um, in this designing our program, our spring program, is that um, sectors like construction and manufacturing uh, are actually looking into 5G a lot now. And we actually have an open call right now in the construction vertical and the uh, corporate innovators that have joined um, our, our program, they've been showing a lot of interest in terms of deploying their own private network. Um, and looking for startups that can actually leverage the 5G network in their, um, in their uh, areas to actually bring in efficiency, um, whether it's in health and safety and security or logistics and site operations. Um, we're seeing a lot of movement within the sectors, uh, within different sectors that we didn't really think uh, we would get a lot of response from. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, can I extend the conversation um, to the environmental side of things? Um, and, and also to the extent that we are actually developing an environment with 5G, which presumably has an impact and changes the environment in which we currently live. If I could pose this to the panel, if there was one example of how you think 5G is going to change that and what impact it could have, um, what would it be? And if, if I could start uh, perhaps with, with Jonathan, from the airways, as it were. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think somebody mentioned this earlier. You you asked, do we need all this bandwidth? And and I think that sort of it's sort of like asking, you know, do we need to go beyond a fourteen four kilobot modem? What what could we possibly get from that? Um, we have all this email already. We're able to digitize communication. Information is moving at the speed of light. What could you want, right? Well, you can't foresee what happens when you get HD to the home in hand and, and the ability to, to, you know, it's hard to see the use cases, hard to see the pulls on the rope, if you will, of the value of the new technology until the tools in the hands of innovators like Helene is working with. Um, so I, I think that in terms of the environmental, you know, I, I think the progress of, of all of our, our, our industrial ecosystem these days is it has an arc towards sustainability has an arc towards cleaning up the earth it, it, it certainly isn't about let's pollute as much as we can anymore to get this next tool in our hands right so to that end and the metaphor being like what, what goes beyond a 14.4 kilobaud modem i'm i'm fascinated to see what we do with a new network platform with a new technology technological platform ubiquitous connectivity that you can trust uh in ways that that applies to civilization's infrastructure, not just our ability to stream information to ourselves. Um, that, that set of capabilities is the fabric of civilization itself. And, and I, I believe that 
we will improve the environment through it. Now, if you want the aviation lens, yeah, absolutely. What we're doing at Connect Air is on-demand flexible flight networks. We're treating uh, the small airplanes that you fly in as IoT themselves and being able to um, put them on a network and, and to have them fly uh, in the most optimized and efficient ways to real customer demand is an enormous environmental improvement. I mean, jet charter flight today um, has 40% empty flights to fly people around, 40% empty flights, right? Um, and, and, you know, being able to actually have these aircraft connected to the network doesn't necessarily have to be a 5G network, that could just be the internet. But, you know, to have us be able to optimize those patterns of A to B and having another customer fly it from B back to A, that's something that hasn't been done in aviation really. Um, and, and to not do it on a top-down scheduled system where we say, we fly from A to B at this time and B to A at this time, and you meet us here when we fly you. Um, that, that's the kind of paradigm shift that, that a technological evolution like 5G allows for in aviation, for sure. And it's just sort of one example. Um, I'm sure that that plays out in, in many other sort of uses of energy and pollution. And there's a lot of slack and a lot of chains that can be tightened. I think we're seeing that as well so in, in, in the mobility in the mobility space as well. There's a there's a trend gathering momentum, which is this switch from ownership of vehicles to usership of vehicles. And I suppose if you just think about your own car, for those of you that own a car today, think about you know in a 24 hour day, how many hours is that car just you know sitting on your driveway or in your garage not being used? And it's a similar thing where what what 5G will enable is the acceleration of that switch from the fact that actually I don't really need to own that vehicle. I can just use a vehicle. And when you add the autonomous vehicle in there and the connected car, where you can actually get a vehicle that arrives at your home, the type of vehicle that you need, when you need it, and you can use it for as long as you need to use it, and then it goes to somebody else, you can see there from a, you know, if you look at a particular vehicle, the actual usage, utilization of that vehicle is going to grow uh, exponentially. So instead of sitting around for 16 hours uh, of the day or you know 20 hours of the day it's, it's going to be uh, used much more often and therefore that's going to contribute yes there's cars on the road clearly however the amount of vehicles on the road uh, is going to uh, it's going to reduce so we're seeing a big trend in that move towards usership um, and not ownership and the, the other trend linked to that again that um, 5g will just enable it's already happening but is that move from ice vehicles or internal combustion engines petrol or diesel to most of us, um, to EVs. And what 5G is going to enable is a much more insight, much more intelligent insight from that vehicle that's going to enable us to ident you know, carry out, say, preventative maintenance uh, jobs in a vehicle. So you know, vehicles breaking down will become less frequent because you will be able to use the data, use the insights to predict and prevent uh, breakdowns, et cetera, particularly when it comes to batteries. So from my perspective, there's a a number of trends both in the type of vehicle that we drive but in also how we drive it and you know whether or not we own it so maybe i can also add uh, following what you said it's the fact that uh, yes uh, let's say 5g uh, it allows uh, with the combination of 5g and iot a more intelligent and uh, intelligent use of the resources because you have all this information so you uh, actually you were talking about, for example, connected car, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle of, uh, to infrastructure, for example. You can understand how much information is exchanged, but this sensing more intelligent exchange of information will actually bring a lot towards a sustainable, let's say more sustainable solution. And also I would like also to bring another example where uh, we have been uh, actually working a lot uh, with uh, some company is the, let's say, the contribution of 5G towards, uh, for example, telehealth. So the fact that uh, 5G is uh, in a certain way revolutionizing the, um, the healthcare sector with the telemedicine, but also with a more advanced uh, technology, for example, uh, even uh, preparing a, a digital uh, twin of the human body where, let's say, to, to see what if a scenario, and this is already something that is actually happening. Uh, and in fact, there are already tests, uh, very <clears throat> important uh, done 
in the Institute of Medicine of the Imperial College, with whom we are in contact. And the other one is also in, in the education sector. So e-learning, for example, but also training. So the reskilling of the, of the people. Okay. Anthony. Yeah, I, th I think there's some interesting kind of crossover between um, kind of Rob's area and just, I'll, I'll claim Jonathan's area as well, even though yeah, it's a bit too high tech for me. But the I was at a conference just yesterday um, and there was um, commercial property investors and they were saying that, you know, because you know, we've got more computing power in our phone than got us to the moon. OK, and so that, you know, that the pandemic and working from home has been, you know, a huge catalyst and and interestingly, because commercial property people, you just thought they'd be talking their own book, talking up commercial property. And they said, look, working from home, the office isn't dead. Working from home is here to stay. And they think, you know, maybe 20 to 40 percent of the time you'll you'll work from home. So one, one or two days a week. Now, that has a huge impact, mm -hmm. you know, positive impact in terms of environment, in terms of travel and car usage and transport usage. And you know, it means that and as Roberta was saying, you know, the more and more rural areas via satellite that are connected via 5G, the more of us we can work from home. And an another point raised at this conference, which was fascinating, was you know, those of us who are kind of fortunate enough um, to live in kind of big, expensive cities often can't afford to live in a place that's got enough space to work from home. Right. You're, you're sharing a house, you're in a small flat. And so the, the working from home, coming to the office one or two days a week allows you to live in an area where you can afford a property that's better suited to your needs. So I, th I think 5G could lead to a kind of a population shift. You know, we've been having urbanization for what, 100, 150 years. I think, you know, it might not reverse, but I think it will slow down and people will think, actually where where do I want to live rather than where do I have to live as I'm you know if I tether to my phone I don't have to be tethered to the office. Hmm. Right. Alina in terms of 5G and, and, and the investment if you had one example how do you see the next um, period of time sort of changing the way that you would actually engage with companies and get those startups scaled up as it were? Yeah so um uh, at Waira and also at Spring, um, what we're trying to do with startups is help them future-proof their business, right? So that means getting them ready for 5G and helping them build up, build their um, 5G roadmap. So um, the thing, the thing about 5G, it, it, it actually brings to life all of the things that we've imagined before, um, like automation, um, energy monitoring. Um, smarter homes, digital twins, uh, as, it, as it has been mentioned, um, calves, shared economy. Um, and so what we are actually trying to help the startups build that roadmap and um, engage them with investors um, after they are able to develop a commercial relationship with corporate. So um, the, the way we run our programs is in an open innovation uh, as an open innovation platform, meaning we bring in challenge owners, big corporates that actually have interest in deploying uh, certain solutions. Um, and so the startups leave with a POC, leave the program with a POC, that is the intention. So um, in our previous, um, in the previous program that we've just run, for instance, um, the two ones that I can mention, we had 10, but I'm just gonna mention two. One is Great Parrot, um, and they, they, they were working on an AI powered computer vision software. Um, that could help increase transparency and automation and recycling. And they were using 5G to actually, um, they used 5G, 5G's low latency to actually increase their efficiency. Um, and we saw a lot of interest um, from our corporate partners with their solution. And so um, as long as there's interest in the market, investors will be interested. But yeah. that is what we're trying to do as part of our program to um, to build this ecosystem in which both uh, clients and suppliers can innovate together. And in that way, investors would also start putting in money into, um, into 5G deployed solutions. And that's a really good point. I mean, in all of the conversations <clears throat> about 5G, you very much get a sense that we're in field of dreams territory. If we build it, they will come. Um, yes. I think that, uh, and I'd like to um, 
I'd like to uh, throw this uh, this question over to Malcolm, Malcolm Ross. Um, Malcolm, it, typically in the past, people have built things and then we have used them. I get the sense that this is more of a collegiate or a, um, a cooperation process where the telcos are coming through with 5G, but equally a lot of that 5G development is being driven by the other side, the people who use it. Would, would that be fair? Well, I, I think, you know, we, we've been very good at building those field of dreams and then people come. And I don't think the mobile industry is particularly good at doing anything different. What we're outstanding at is providing a standardized systems that make it very easy for any individual, any small business, any corporate to link to any other uh, through their phones, through their IoT devices, one-to-one, -one, any to any, many to many. Um, it links them to payment systems. It links them to everything in a plug and play manner. Uh, in other words, you know, 5G goes one step further than 4G has done in reducing the limits to our imagination. Now it's really up to consumers and entrepreneurs and the corporates to uh, push their imagination and take up what we've done. Um, it's a bit like, you know, Apple. Apple created the Apple Store and it probably put some thousands of apps on it itself. But if it had limited it just to the imagination of Apple, we'd just have a couple of thousand apps on the stores today. The reason we have millions is because they created a standard um, platform where anybody um, from individuals to small and medium sized businesses to entrepreneurs to corporates could put millions of apps on there. And I can see millions of OTT and IoT apps putting on our platforms, but please don't expect us to be able to provide all that imagination because frankly, our industry is an engineering industry, not an imaginative one. <laughs> oh, thank you. We have a question from, from, from the floor as we've had throughout this, but I, I'm very intrigued with this. And again, Malcolm, if I could start with you, it is, how do you see different MNOs collaborating in 5G testing. Hardware and the applications all need to be tested and with different networks. So will 5G testing become a challenge for this ecosystem? Well, you, you use the word ecosystem and yes, we have a very big ecosystem and most of that is done outside our industry. Um, you know, the vast majority of MNOs today no longer own the towers. They've sold them off to tower companies and just lease the capacity back. Um, we buy in equipment from uh, the, the equipment suppliers. Um, we look at it very much for the, the, uh, the Apples, the, the Samsungs, the Huawei's, the Nokia's and so on to provide the equipment. And very often these days they provide that as a service. Uh, we pay us a, a fixed amount every year. You know, we're very good at running things and we're very good as an industry of pulling together uh, vast networks. Um, but uh, and making, thing, and making sure things work in a standard way across those networks and are interconnectable. Um, but uh, we're not that good at uh, innovating ourselves. And the last thing you'd want is for one MNO to develop a fantastic smartphone that nobody else in the world could connect to because the other MNOs were using a different one. Um, I mean, you know, the reason I was late was because I was having exactly that problem with the IT industry um, on, on Zoom. Um, and uh, I've noticed they've put my backing back to front again, so. Uh, no, no, you look, you look uh, the right way round, if I may, in all sorts of different ways, Malcolm, um, <laughs> are, from where I can see you. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, we continue to have some, some company, uh, some questions coming through, but just before we go into the specifics, I'd just like to ask the, the panel again. Um, we, we live in a world now where, where governments are involved with us all. We have spent an enormous amount of money um, as, as our governments have spent an enormous amount of money through the last 12 months. Question to the panel, is the 5G rollout dependent on a, uh, a benign government influence and can governments um, assist in the rollout or should they step back? Uh, Jonathan, in that you are, um, technically speaking, uh, bringing to life air travel, which I am scared of, I'm very keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um Innovation does really well with standardization and regulation, actually. Um, so, so Malcolm brought up the standardization, the interoperability notion of these networks, which is fundamental. It's not just that you can get a one hop connection to one mobile edge computer for one autonomous car. 
It's that multiple OEMs can produce multiple autonomous cars that can talk to each other on a CV to X modem and share LIDAR data and, and ar arbitrate a four-way intersection, a government com regulated commons mm -hmm. in the most optimized and safe way possible for all of us, right? A four-way intersection is exactly a, a perfect example of a non-polemic example of government and innovation working together, right? Where we all agree, I think, that all we want out of a four-way intersection is the highest throughput optimization and safety. I don't think there are any other political opinions about a four-way intersection. It's interesting if you talk to urban planners, they get really hot about rotaries versus four-way intersections and things like that. And what's the best way to, to distribute that traffic through there. But um, if you look at an autonomous vehicle world, that takes that social contract, that trust becoming digitized, right? It needs, the, the way we trust a protocol to say, I, I came first, so I go next, you know, and the first in, first out protocol that we all trust, that becomes digitized in this world. And it, it ultimately, um, we arbitrate the, the intersection much better than our, our frail human senses can, right? And if you look at a, a, a diagram of four-way intersection of autonomous vehicles moving through it, it is the most optimal thing you can possibly do. They move through like this, like a weave, right? Because they don't have to stop. There's no more stops at a four-way intersection, no more stop lights. There's just an interoperability that when you join the regulated commons that the governments basically look after, you, you do achieve something new and, and much more powerful than, than any company intended or any government intended on. Yeah. And I, I didn't Sorry. talk about aviation. If you, it, we got a lot of four-way intersections in the sky too that that, that <laughs> metaphor plays well for. Um, and except for the four-way intersections become three-dimensional and um, no, four-dimensional really and, and, and about a, a real swarm of, of aircraft moving around. But the same principle applies, right? Do, what do we want out of the airspace around Heathrow? The highest throughput optimization to the highest standards of safety. That's what the that's what the social contract demands of it, right? We can we can do better than we are today at those at achieving those two goals. Interesting, Roberta, you wanted to say something. Yeah. No, what I wanted to say is that uh, connection uh, to what was say. Indeed, in the connected car, clearly there is a role of. Uh, government for the regulation. Imagine this is something uh, that we are experiencing with some of our application exactly in this time where uh, there, there is the point of uh, uh, autonomous car and how they uh, can be put on the public road, okay? So it's not something that can be done. So you need the regulation. So the regulator are talking with us so not with us directly, but directly with the company. So there is this point. Then of course, there is all the, the, the point of the insurance and, uh, and uh, that, that's maybe it's not uh, related to the government. But uh, okay, I fully agree that uh, let's say for the health sector, for let's say the connected car, but there is also another aspect that uh, in addition to the regulation is the security. In the sense that with the 5G, with all this data that they are exchanged between vehicles and people and so on, you need to have the secure. So there is a role that the government should place in making sure that the information that is exchanged is secure, is a trustful. So I think this is also another important role that the, that the government should take uh, and is uh, uh, indeed uh, taking away uh, with the, we have seen now with the GDPR, for example, with the privacy. So there, there are a lot of measures that actually are coming and they are coming uh, more in the next months. Elena, I see you nodding. I mean, the, what, what is the role for government in, in sort of that very end of the, the entrepreneurial or the startup ecosystem that you're, you're real pretty in? Yeah, I think in terms of the standardization and regulation aspect, it's been covered, but um, something I'd like to add is, for instance, Spring is, is funded by the government um, at the moment. And also like within our programs, we are closely working with uh, different authorities and councils, even as challenge owners. Um, so for instance, for our first program, which was focused on green innovation, we had the West Midlands Combined Authority as a challenge owner, and now we have uh, Transport for West Midlands as a, as a challenge owner for our construction themed um, accelerator. So 
Um, even when it comes to the open innovation ecosystem, we need government uh, authorities and councils to be involved and to work closely with startups because um, some of the solutions that the startups are, are working on can be used to uh, transform the infrastructure um, that it can be deployed throughout the city or you know throughout the nation as well. And so um, in that terms, um, government plays a big role in terms of accelerating um, innovation with 5G. And on that point, and let's throw it into sort of both um, Rob and Rob and Anthony. Um, in the UK, we have had um, policy um, announcements between um, the European Space Agency and the ECMS, for example, um, and we have a we have a, a, a political a government situation which is obviously putting quite a lot into 5G. But do you see that on the ground? To uh, to um, to Alina. Oh, to Helena. Um, so yes, um, so for for our program, um, again, it's supported by DCMS, and so we work closely with them. Um, and in terms of uh, introductions for our startups as well, again, I'm really focused on the startups, the entrepreneurs. Sure. Side, um, and paving their way and making introductions. Um, they, it's been we, we've been get, getting a good amount of support in terms of that. So, um, yeah, from the from the spring perspective and our experience, it's been really supportive. Uh, it's been a supportive environment and um, helping us actually bring uh, you know our idea to life and creating this open innovation ecosystem around five G. Okay, no, I wanted to add because you, you mentioned it. In fact, I've been, and I'm still uh, we are, I'm leading a lot of discussion with the DCMS. I have to say that uh, <clears throat> the DCMS has been very supportive, very interested. And why, it, it, in fact, we have even some kind of a formal document of cooperation, collaboration, because it's of the rural area. That's why. <clears throat> So how, let's say, to improve uh, the rural area with it, so on. So that's why we, uh, we, we send, uh, I think it was uh, last year, a joint call on the transport and logistics, where the idea was to develop uh, services to uh, basically to rely on advanced technology. So satellite communication, but also 5G, but also other <clears throat> technology, which could be machine learning and so on. Maybe I take also the opportunity now, sorry, to, to say that on the, on the 17th of March, we launch another uh, activity that is for which we are really in, a, in a, it's not tailored only to the UK because, you know, we are, let's say, European and so on. But this is on the smart uh, autonomous shipping where we have a very good contact and interest from a British Port Association and so on. In this case, what they want to do is to see, let's say, how um, the port ecosystem and also the shipping can take advantage to, to 5G, so to go to the so-called port 4.0. So I think this is a call that uh, <coughs> is open until uh, the end of the year. And there will be other coming because we have a full roadmap of activity. So in, in this sense, to respond, I would say, yes, it's not only security regulation, but also active promoting the use of, of 5G and services, making it innovating in 5G. Thank you, thank you. I, I want to go on to some, some other questions from, from the floor, <clears throat> but just to finish off on government's role in this, Anthony, Rob, Quickly, do you see a role for government or is it more about um, the ecosystem developing itself? Well, I, I personally think that the government needs to think bigger about 5G and I think they need to move from a kind of a nudge to a shove policy. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is, you know, overnight in lockdown one, you know, we made the situation where nobody left their homes, right? Who would have thought that would happen, you know, in 2020? And industry certainly the industry I'm involved in the housing industry it's very slow moving right and they and they see regulation as a as a as a stick and it's like well people are buying houses why do we need to change things you know people are buying cars why do we need to change things and I think what government has shown 
with lockdown rules is that, you know, if you shove, things happen. And so if they said to car manufacturers, actually, we need to bring this date forward, right, in terms of EV, in terms um, of co connectivity, in terms of autonomous stuff, things things will get done. And I think with, with housing and, and the big picture, you know, get 5G everywhere. And I think that the, where, where the government's maybe missing stuff is this could be the biggest redistribution of wealth across the country we've ever seen, right? Because you know, at the moment we invest loads in transport infrastructure, you know, HS2, and you know, we talk about the northern powerhouse of the north-south divide in wealth in the, in the UK. And typically what uh, a transport investment does is just speeds up the time people can get to the south. Whereas free people up so they can live where they want to live. They're still earning their London wages, but living outside London. And that wealth ripple effect could, I think it's a huge opportunity. So so more shove, less nudge, I think. <laughs> and I do think where, where they do bring in policies, it's also thinking about you know other, other sectors. So a good example of that would be the, uh, the drive for EVs. So in the UK, we know that after 2030, you can no longer buy a petrol or diesel vehicle, uh, which is great. So everybody's rushing towards EVs. However, at the same time, if you buy a house today, the likelihood is that house does not have home charging for your EV. Now, you're going to keep your house. If you buy a house today, you're probably there for maybe 15, 20 years. I think know the average years, but it's certainly going to be beyond 2030. So already that house is obsolete in terms of what you need to operate your vehicle efficiently and effectively from that house. So you know, there's a policy brought in in one place, but we haven't yet got the policy that um, helps in, in the housing market, for example. So I think from my point of view, it's just making sure, like Anthony said, just think bigger, but think laterally as well in terms of, okay, where are the knock-on impacts of these decisions? And let's make sure that we've got policies applied across different sectors. Okay, and thank you for that. I, I just want to think it, it needs to be mentioned as the, as the one yank, I think, on the phone here that um, government has a great role of, of spending money on infrastructure. It always has. And, and um, we're going through that in the US right now, the major infrastructure bills going through. To me, that's the most significant player on the field from government in the 5G conversation. It's not regulation. It's not our FCC mm -hmm. saying, oh, this is how you slice bandwidth. I was a Verizon exec. Trust me, we have plenty of engineers there that know how to slice bandwidth and don't need a regulator to sort of say, do it this way, right? Um, so it's, to me, the, the government role that we haven't talked about at all here is spend money on the freaking infrastructure, like yeah. put it up like, like the power lines of 100 years ago, make it available to people that can't afford it. May, you know, there, there's, a, there's a huge role to say, let's put this, this 28K modem in <laughs> today because people aren't pulling on the rope because they're using 14.4. Government can do that, right? They can, they can lay the pipes really, really well and spend a lot of money doing it. So go government if you're out there, spend money on 5G infrastructure. If I, if I can just mention a couple of, of things on that, because I think it's, it's very important to understand uh, where the capital comes from. Um, during COVID, we've seen uh, more than a doubling of total traffic carried on our networks worldwide. And that network is two thirds of the entire population of the planet. Um, we have, uh, more than doubled the speed of Moore's law in telecommunications. But we don't look any thanks. It's like uh, Anthony was talking about the roads. Um, people only notice roads when they're congested. You don't suddenly cheer because you go to, from A to B very fast. Because it, um, So we're not going to get any praise for, for doing what we've done over the last year. Um, we, we spend 90% uh, of profits on building additional capacity and networks, and we put it where people need it. We know from our networks where the co congestion is, so that's where we invest. If government wants to bring 5G to places we cannot economically cover, then we do that. That's happening in Germany, it's happening in a lot of places, and we're happy for that. Um, one of our biggest grudges is that unlike uh, Apple and, uh, sorry, I shouldn't mention names like that, but a lot of the fangs who can put, um, their uh, investment subsidiaries in uh, Pacific Islands and therefore avoid, avoid, avoid paying taxes, we're all national. And so every uh, mo mobile operator worldwide pays full corporation tax in every country. And on top of that, every five years, we have to buy additional spectrum, which is additional tax. All of that money comes from profits, which essentially means we could, we've got less to invest in our network because we're only spending five to 10% on dividends to shareholders. Um, if 
governments really wanted to have 5G rolled out quickly, and, and you know, we're in the middle of building out 6G already. Um, if they really want us to put that everywhere for everybody, then please tax us a little less. <laughs> <laughs> I think Malcolm is over. You, you brought us on to the next, the next part of where we're going here. I think that, I mean, to a very great extent, it's easy to see 5G as a sort of Western or developed country. Uh, situation clearly it's not it's global as Roberta mm -hmm. has highlighted we're putting satellites into the sky um, Jonathan is flying aircraft we're all traveling around um, at almost borderless in that regard so to, again starting with you Malcolm but going across the panel how does this how is 5g an opportunity for us to actually bridge the gap between the developing and the developed economies well, it, I, I, I'm a very keen diver, so I end up in some pretty remote islands like the western end of Papua New Guinea. And you see there, you know, rope is high technology, but you go to the local cafes and they've got internet cafe, all the kids have got smartphones and so on. You know, 5G lag is perhaps a year and a half behind what you get in a western country. There are places in the United States that's a, that are behind Papua New Guinea in terms of uh, rollout of 5G, for example. Um, and we, we are, um, you know, there's, there's actually no such thing as a, a, a clear division between the Gs. Um, just before 5G was announced, we were on 4G and a half, which was almost the performance of 5G. Uh, countries that put in 5G two years ago, like Switzerland, they're already halfway towards 6G and we're already talking about and, and experimenting with 6G. It's a continuous improvement. It's just very neat to call it generations. And those generations are put wherever they make economic sense. And the fact is these things are so profitable, they are put almost everywhere as quickly as we possibly can. So in reality, they're rolled out everywhere. Now, if the government wants as a, a case of policy to make some uh, village in a rural area um, a, a digital hub, um, and we don't find it economical to do that, if they will subsidize us, we'll put in the, that, that network. Um, so, you know, it's purely economic and it's so competitive, this industry, if, the, if it's possible to make money by rolling out the latest generation somewhere, we do it. And, you know, the, the ESA is doing that by adding it in through satellites. We're having high altitude platforms. We're having uh, balloon systems and so on. Wherever it makes economic sense to put these things, we're putting it. But we don't get thanks. <laughs> well, 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 thank you. Uh, <laughs> Roberta, I mean... I appreciate it. ESA has a view on this. I mean, where, where do you, where does ESA play a role here, and in is five G a component part of that? So, as I said, uh, basically, it was in two thousand nineteen. Yes, in two thousand nineteen, that at uh, the ministerial conference, it was decided to establish in the European Space Agency strategic program line, which was called five G. And the idea was, again, to see how, let's say, how would be, what would be the role of the satellite communication, but also of the other space asset within the 5G. So in the, indeed, the, today, there is, uh, uh, let's say, there, there are specific, uh, uh, because you know what we are doing is, we are funding industry, okay? And we have a call which are dedicated to develop technology, for example, uh, products and uh, services uh, using 5G, but also really technology. For example, we have a trial and so on. And uh, I just mentioned the, the thematic call uh, with, uh, with the DCMS. I mentioned the 5G hub. So the 5G hub here in the UK will be actually the, uh, the is a 5G hub in overall uh, the, the agency in all uh, overall Europe because we, we have uh, 22 member states. And, and this will be, let's say, the center where ESA will put money, let's say, to encourage uh, development of products or technology, whatever. So it's very much uh, important. And as you said, of course, uh, there is the 6G. Uh, coming. What is important for us is that the 5G with the vertical, uh, it was created differently from the 4G. So the vertical, we are working in the vertical, 
and uh, and we try to see what which services uh, uh, can be developed. One area that has been not mentioned is also the finance because uh, everybody uh, talk about the fintech, insurtech, but also there we see already uh, services coming with the 5G and with the blockchain with a lot of data exchanging and so on. Specifically now we see in the, in the in the insurance sector. So this is also another another part where uh, we see uh, 5G interest from company industry coming to us. And when they come to us, you may say, why you are coming, uh, they are coming. Because in their services, in addition to the 5G, they may need the map. No, they may need high resolution map, for example, or they need uh, satellite communication, for example, because it's secure, reliable, uh, for this uh, backup situation, rural area, when the terrestrial uh, network is not available, you can go through uh, satellite communication. So they are coming uh, to us. And of course, don't forget another important space asset is uh, the navigation, because when you, you use uh, your phone, you, you, every, <laughs> maybe you don't realize that you use a, a GPS, you use a Galileo, you use a Bay or whatever, but you use a satellite navigation. And, the, and the, let's say, is the integration of all this data with the 5G and the, with the other technology. I understand. We are coming to the end of our, um, of our session here. And, and obviously, we need to talk about how we invest in 5G, not just from the government point of view, not just from large corporates, but as an ecosystem. So I can throw this out to the panel and perhaps um, start with Helena, who obviously is, is in that very space. Uh, investing in 5G, does it require actually identifying the 5G application or should we just actually assume that 5G is going to roll out and these, these opportunities will emerge? Um. So how we need to see 5G is, um, from my perspective, is as an enabler of all other um, of all other emerging technologies and also solutions, right? So um, when you invest in 5G, you're also in the infrastructure per se. But there, there's also another push that you're doing that is um, enabling all of this innovation to happen within several sectors. You know, the ones that I've mentioned, for instance, construction, manufacturing, transport, all of them can potentially benefit from the benefits of 5G and the, the low latency, the high speed. So um, there is, the, investing in 5G, look at it as an enabler and like all of the opportunities that it opens up to. Understood. Jonathan, I mean, after the government has spent all of our money, how do investors um, pick up on, on the, the ecosystem? What I mean, which I mean, your company is um, something which benefits from 5G, uses 5G, provides 5G functionality to its customers as it goes through. Um, how do you invest in that yourself and what should investors look for from a company such as yours, which is a beneficiary of 5G? Investor tips on 5G, is that what you're asking for here? I, I, it was a very long winded way of going yeah. that to my <laughs> into a Monday, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I've lived on the entrepreneur side more, so I know investors from looking at them or being one. So um, the, I, I'd say my advice to all investors is find something that's valuable and use your capital, leverage it into a new scale period. Um, if, you're, if you don't have the value system understood, and that does start with what Lena's saying, a real application on top of the enabler, then, then stay away. Unless you're you know, good friends with Malcolm and you understand what a mobile edge computer is and how the, uh, the problems of 5G right now are a little bit in those laser beams getting reflected across each other and the, and the little pieces and parts that it takes for, for them to go around corners and things like that. Uh, with those laser beams, those are the technical problems of 5G that we're already into the standards process of 6G, but people will need to continue to build the widgets and parts of the 5G and 6G infrastructure. So, but I'd stay away from that as an investor, unless you know exactly which RF infrastructure <laughs> companies you're investing in, because that's very specific technology that Verizon and, you know, and, and T-Mobile and uh, Deutsche Telekom are, are only going to buy very specific startup innovations in that ecosystem, right? So you'd have to really have some expertise there. 
But in terms of the applications on top, yeah, I mean, this is the next generation of the internet become physical, if you will, right? And, and so if you can find the places of value like I do in aviation where um, increasing the speed of connectivity, the trust of connectivity, most importantly um, in, in, my, in, in the transport sector, um, then yeah, you're going to create new value systems there very clearly, like, like we continue to do the evolution of technology. So it's, it's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no broad, like simple brush to say, I'm going to invest in 5G. Sorry, there isn't. Maybe Ver <laughs> invest in Verizon, my former alma mater now, okay? The, the VZ ticker symbol. Um, <laughs> or, or Huawei, honestly, if you want to be, if I want to be a little controversial from my alma mater right now. Um, so, <laughs> you know, they're publicly traded companies that are investing in 5G just fine that investors can join. In terms of the startup ecosystem, it's the applications on top that are super interesting. And I think that you need to ask your entrepreneur what that really means. Don't just wave your hands about, we'll use 5G to get faster. That doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, you have to explain why a mobile edge computer in one hop matters to your application, whether it be a uh, Leonardo surgeon saying, I can have zero latency when I touch a heart across remotely, right? That makes sense to me. Same thing with a helicopter, autonomous helicopter may be landing to a rooftop. The precision with it, within which I need to be to say, you know, make sure that these people's lives get to that rooftop is nine nines of certainty. So therefore one hop, zero latency, and I get to a mobile edge computer that gives me a high fidelity understanding of the space in digital form that no human could ever hope to have. And that's what gets that robot onto that rooftop, right? There's a reason for 5G there, but you need me to deconstruct it. You can't just say 5G makes aviation faster, right? And, <laughs> right. Yeah. But no, I, I get that. So I would like to close the session with, with, with Malcolm. But before I do that, to go to Anthony and Rob, both entrepreneurs, both um, in a space which perhaps 5G is helping, but 5G is not part of your, your pitch to the market. How, how very quickly do you, do you see that in terms of, I mean, as Jonathan said, it's, a, it's the platform, it's not what you would go out and say you're doing. Uh, yeah, I, I think for, from, from our, and I keep banging on that we're quite low tech, you know, housing is still zero G. And I think we can be the bridge to get it to kind of five, six, 10 G in, in the future. You know, do, as an entrepreneur, what excited me about, you know, twin dig, digital twins, we build digital twins of every property in the UK. You know, why, why do I find that exciting? You know, do we buy and sell books online? Yes. Do we buy our groceries online? Yes. Do we buy and sell houses online? No. Are we accepting of the digital reality? Yes. Will 5G allow us to digitize things and buy and sell houses online? Yes. You know, could that expand the market by 50%? Yes. You know, that, that's why I do what I do. I think, you know, it, it as it, we, we can apply 5G and it really opens up the opportunity in the housing market. Okay. Yeah, and I think from, from, from a mobility perspective, I, I totally agree. For me, it's an enabler. It's an absolute enabler. And the, the problem I think we'll find is there's going to be just a, a tsunami of data, a tsunami of insights. Everybody's going to have so much data. It's going to be overload. And, and I'm, I'm a big fan of just keeping things simple. And, and the question, so what, is one that I often use. And it's you know, when you're looking at the applications, yes, that are using 5G as a um, as an enabler to go faster or whatever it might be, it's the question of so what? Okay, well, so so um, I would use that as my kind of guiding light from an investment perspective. Just ask that question, so what? Because we are all going to be absolutely drowning in data, and I think you've got to find the real nuggets that make a real difference to people, as as opposed to just being, gosh, more things I need to manage, there's more apps I need to manage, there's more data. So yeah, I'd, I'd ask the question, so what? And, and, and I will, uh, Malcolm, to close, um, investing in 5G, there's a lot of money going into the infrastructure, but in your view, where are the key points? Where, where are those pinch points as, as, the, as the chaps have sort of mentioned so far? I think uh, three, three areas I would look for. Um, first of all, you know, I, as I say, you know, we're pushing back the boundaries of limits to our imagination. So let's use it. And we're using a system here that is essentially 30 year old technology. Um, time ha as time has gone on, our screens have got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. While if you look at the gaming industry, we've got three dimensional virtual reality, augmented reality and surround sound. It's surely to give just one tiny example of the uh, way that we can fill that imagination um, our technology in 5G would allow us to be wearing a 3D headset, 4, 4K 
screen, so the resolution of our retina, 200 frames a second worldwide. That's what 5G enables us to do today. We as an industry can't push that. It's got to be the entrepreneurs that find those sorts of needs and pull it towards us. But it means you could be in a virtual football stadium anywhere you are on the planet and hear the crowd and see 100,000 virtual people around you. That's the sort of limits that we've pushed back with 5G and 6G is going to push back even more. So it's an enabler to an amazing amount of imagination. The second thing is very pragmatic. If we're doing all this exciting thing, why does the stock market value us like an electric utility? Our PE ratios are 13 to 15 and uh, the, the FANGs are 40. So I would invest in one of the lower priced um, uh, telcos and use a, a shareholder of activism to get that rating up. Um, you would add $6 trillion of market cap to the, the MNOs worldwide if you were to do that. Um, and I, I think the, the third thing that's happening, and I think what Apple uh, announced just a few days ago is a, a sign of that. Big data is all about uh, packaging uh, people's data so that the highest bidders for advertising words can push adverts to people who don't want anything. Um, what, what Apple's doing by taking away the ads and what we as a mobile industry do, we have incredible data. As Jonathan pointed out, we know where everything is within a few centimeters. Um, we know who connects with everybody at what time and so on. That's deep in our networks. We, we can't access it. It's deep and we only use it for for, for um, billing. Um, if we were to help the each individual pull towards them what they wanted in terms of product service connectivity with people, uh, pull rather than advertising push, I think we're going to add 10% to the GDP. And we won't get thanked about it because we're just the motorways. We've made our motorways a bit wider and so on. Uh, people will only blame us when there's congestion. They don't blame us. They don't uh, thank us when all these things come. But I hope the stock market will recognize that the MNOs are bringing that and we will increase our ratings a bit. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We have come to the hour and I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their contributions, for, uh, for uh, putting Putting up with my questions and the questions from the, from the audience in terms of a broad spectrum, I'd like to thank you all for taking part and also all for your very, very keen insights. I feel that the rubber is going to meet the road um, and that road is going to be broader. I think that we're, <laughs> we're in a situation where we will see what happens, but obviously what we're going to see is going to be quite amazing. Again, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we will be um, playing uh, this back. On, our, on the websites, we will send you all details of that. We will be hosting um, another uh, of these briefing sessions. It will be on May the 28th, and it will be the future of sustainability and value. I'm looking forward to that. And it will be, I hope, as much of interest and insight as this one has been. As I said at the very start, we are, we are leading this season and this series to the event in Mykonos on October the 5th. On October the 1st, I do apologize. I would encourage you to register for that event. It brings together what I hope are going to be the insights that we're going to be hearing over the next couple of months. Again, thank you all very much. Um, stay safe and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Cheers. <laughs>